I'm Nick Monfort, Professor of Digital Media in Comparative Media Studies and Writing. I also teach at the School for Poetic Computation in New York. I study creative computing and develop computational art and poetry. My computer-generated poetry books include Shebang, The True List, uh, which is the first in the, the recent Using Electricity series from Counterpath, and Hard West Turn. My digital projects, including The Deletionist, Scenes Far Between, and uh, the translation project renderings, these are all collaborations, are available at uh, nickm.com. And uh, I have uh, MIT Press books, some collaborative, some individually authored, which are The New Media Reader, Twisty Little Passages, <coughs> Racing the Beam, Chin, Tin Print, Char String, 205.5, Plus Grand 1, Go to Tin. That's the reason why I have to introduce myself, by the way. Um, and exploratory programming for the arts and humanities, and most recently, the future. So, um, I'll next introduce uh, Stefan Helmreich, who's on the opposite side of the table, who's the Elting E. Morrison Professor of Anthropology. He received his PhD in anthropology from Stanford. His research is focused on how biologists think through the limits of life as a category of analysis, uh, which he's taken up in three books, Alien Ocean, Anthropological Voyages in Microbial Seas, Silicon Second Nature, Culturing Artificial Life in a Digital World, and most recently, Sounding the Limits of Life, Essays in the Anthropology of Biology and Beyond. Um, while on sabbatical this semester, uh, Stefan holds fellowships from uh, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation and at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, where he's completing a manuscript that offers an ethnographic account of how scientists measure, model, and monitor ocean waves in an era of climate change. Um, even though he is on sabbatical with these two very, very desirable fellowships, uh, he's kind enough to join us for the panel. So an extra measure of thanks to Stefan for being with us today. Um, and next to me, um, Adam Harhorowitz is a master's student in the Fluid Interfaces Group at the Media Lab. His work aims to augment human awareness, translating advances in neuroscience, into the design of interventions and interactive experiences across the arts and sciences. He works on how technology can show us parts of ourselves that remain otherwise invisible, allowing for introspection, wellness, and wonder. He has background as a neuroscience tech at MIT's McGovern Institute, studying mindfulness meditation and mind wandering, and as an artist scientist at the Marina Abramovich Institute, together, tying together neuroscience and performance art. His work has been shown at the Cannes Film Festival, Transmedial, South by Southwest, uh, the Beijing Media Biennale, um, SESC Pompeia, and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Here at MIT, he leads the Skunk Works team of MIT Hacking Arts. His current projects include the microscopic virtual reality adventures inside the human body, along with dream control and capture in the liminal space between wakefulness and sleep. Caroline A. Jones, far end of the table, studies modern and contemporary art with a particular focus on its technological modes of production, distribution, and reception. She is professor of art history in HTC, the History, Theory, and Criticism of Architecture and Art program. She is trained in visual studies and art history at Harvard, doing graduate work at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York before completing her PhD at Stanford University. Previous to this, she worked in museum administration and exhibit curation, holding positions at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and at the Harvard, at the Harvard University Art Museum, while she also completed two documentary films. Um, beyond her work at those institutions, her exhibitions and films have been shown at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C., the Hara Museum in Tokyo, Boston University Art Gallery, and MIT's List Visual Arts Center, among other venues. Caroline has written and edited a number of books, most recently, The Global Work of Art, which focuses on her ongoing research interests, including globalism, the agency of the artist, and new media art. And finally, Agnieszka Courant is an interdisciplinary conceptual artist who examines how complex social, economic, and cultural systems can operate in ways that confuse distinctions between fiction and reality, or nature and culture. Her work investigates the economy of the invisible, in which immaterial and imaginary entities, fictions, phantoms, energy flows, and emergent processes influence political, economic, and ecological systems. She often collaborates with scientists, uh, including biologists, anthropologists, cartographers, economists, computer engineers, and roboticists. Many of her works emulate nature and behave like living organisms, 
self-organized complex systems or bachelor mission. In 2015, she did a commission for the facade of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York. Uh, 2013 to 2014, she presented a major solo exhibition at the Sculpture Center there in, uh, there in New York. In 2010, she re co-represented Poland at the Venice Biennale of Architecture. Our most recent exhibitions include commissions for the Guggenheim Bilbao, SFMOMA, Cleveland Triennial, and uh, La Panacee Montpellier, as well as solo shows at um, uh, SCAB Mo uh, MOA and the CCA in Tel Aviv. Her work's also been exhibited at uh, Palais de Tokyo, the Tate Modern, the Kitchen, um, Vit de Vit, Freeze Projects, Moderna Musée, <coughs> Rumov, uh, Grazer Kunstbüren, and Bona Kunstbüren, uh, Stum der Haag, and uh, Performa Biennial. Um, Agnieszka is currently the Ida Eli Rubin Artist in Residence at MIT's CAST and holds fellowships at the Smithsonian Institute and the Berrigan Institute. Well, as you can guess, we have a group with uh, some relevant expertise and perspective, but also um, a diverse group. And I'd say that uh, the four of you, certainly um, from different perspectives, you undertake types of inquiry, exploring, asking questions, generating new sorts of insights. This is something I think unites people at a university generally, even if they're doing very different sorts of activities. They're, they're somehow undertaking inquiry. So since our occasion here is discussing Agnieszka's work at uh, MIT as an artist, I'd like to ask how she inquires through art and then invite uh, the others of you to explain how artistic inquiry is similar to or different from the types of inquiry that you pursue. much uh, for hosting this kind of wonderful panel. Thank you, um, everyone here, for joining me. Um, I, I like the point of departure of my work is um, are, are the phenomena and na nature of culture that are um, examples of emergence and collective intelligence. Um, these phenomena happen in various complex systems, and uh, complex systems uh, um, can be a termite colony, a human society, human brain, the internet, the urban fabric, or even the stock exchange. There are systems with many components and factors that are so complicated that are often very difficult to um, um, anticipate what's gonna happen in them. They evolve uh, in a nonlinear way. Um, and um, I've been investigating the systems. I want to show very quickly a couple of slides of my point of departure of a couple of my works. I, I'm, I'm going to just comment with like one sentence per, per, per image. So uh, this is an organism that um, inspired a lot of my works, a uh, slime mold that doesn't have any ner nervous system, but um, uh, consists of a si a singular cells that when um, confronted with some form of danger, lack of nutrients or water, um, aggregates into a, like a super organism, into one unit, and moves as one unit and displays uh, signs of intelligence. So it can even go through a maze, and in fact it was um, co-opted for computation by scientists um, such as um, Andrea Domatsky, working in uh, Great Britain, who, who is doing certain, um, um, who's running the Center for Unconventional Computing uh, using um, slime mold and other organisms to perform various operations. Um, uh, uh, this another example of, of emergence and collective intelligence and culture are bacteria of colonies that um, uh, um, perform groupthink. And um, the work of Eshel Ben Jacob, an Israeli scientist who discovered that certain bacteria, for example, make collective decisions where they, let's say, decide to kill off half of the colony for the co collective good, future good of, of, of the remaining. Um, um, uh, bacteria, uh, and so it's kind of like a, uh, in fact, a visualization of a group thing one, one can um, um, consider. Uh, this is a social phenomenon that um, um, 
happened um, on the platform called Reddit about a year ago, and about one million people participated in it. It was a sort of virtual fictional country universe called The Place, where each participant could place uh, uh, a single uh, pixel wherever they wanted in this virtual space, and various um, emergent uh, self-organized processes emerged, uh, so a lot of fictional characters, fictional nations, cults, this is an example of one of them. This is the, uh, the Black Void. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, another um, um, uh, point of departure for, for a lot of my research is, um, is this branch of science that, that analyzes uh, the gross artificial societies. And it started um, in the early 90s, mostly at the Santa Fe Institute uh, by two, two scientists, Epstein and Axel. But some of this earlier research has been done by the economist Thomas Schelling. Um, uh, it's basically a um, um, uh, uh, way of using um, algorithms to, ca to calculate very complex systems of how societies will behave, the in in uh, interplay between individual decisions of, of citizens in a society. So here are some examples of um, one of my works using the uh, this, um, artificial society models based on the Thomas Schelling, the, the economist, his model of self-segregation and how it can actually be computed. Um, Uh, th uh, these are the works that um, stem from uh, all this research. Sorry, I think we lost the image. So these are the works. Um, this is a series called AAI, um, which are um, works that I uh, outsourced crowdsourced to non-human agents, because I'm interested in also forms of non-human intelligence. Uh, um, in the times when uh, um, a lot of scientists are talking about the fact that um, the intelligence is not what the mostly Western culture assumed to be uh, individual and located in the brain, but on the contrary, it's distributed and it's very external to the brain and it doesn't have to be human. Um, so a lot of my work are also taking this as a point of departure. And uh, so these works were um, outsourced to the colonies of living termites. Um, each, each sculpture uh, is built by a colony of approximately a million termites that were supplied with alternative materials such as uh, pigmented sands, um, uh, particles of gold and crystals. And each colony is isolated for um, about three, four months and they just built. And uh, each form is different, N nothing can be anticipated, and um, th there are these hybrid forms that hover somewhere between nature and culture. And what is really interesting that uh, the entomologists uh, point out how each single colony of exactly the same species um, produces very different shapes of termite mounds, which also corresponds to a different a collective personality of each colony. So they, just like humans, they can represent different collective personalities or just like social movements that sometimes can be dynamic and fast, sometimes more slow, dispersed, or concentrated, headless or not. Um, so this is an, um, these works also kind of um, relate to my interest in soft exploitations present in society, uh, especially by corporations using um, mm, algorithms to harvest data of uh, uh, mm, citizens who are uh, completely unaware of this. So this is like a kind of distributed model of soft Exploitation. Th that's a continuation of this work where I am uh, pouring um, uh, uh, hot sink into abandoned thermite mounds and they form these negative casts of various, so they are like internal portraits of various societies. They are poured in the African desert. Um, and uh, this, uh, uh, these uh, works entitled um, The End of Signature that I've done various iterations of um, are related to um, my reflections about um, how the aggregated value of social capital can not only be exploited, uh, which is unfortunately happening so often in contemporary societies, but it can also uh, be precisely calculated and can be used or analyzed uh, for a good cause, and, and that we should maybe try to embrace it. So, uh, so what I'm uh, doing in this work is I'm, I, I developed, uh, together with computer programmers, an algorithm that morphs 
uh, thousands of signatures that we first collect and scan into a collective signature. Uh, and I've developed these collective signatures for various social movements, communities, and, and um, social groups. Uh, the first one was at the um, facade of the Guggenheim of the um, museum in New York, and this is a collective portrait of all the visitors, kind of um, alluding to the fact that uh, viewership today also became a form of labor, a visible labor, because audiences are constantly Instagramming images and, and circulating images, and it became a sort of form of invisible labor and contributing to the value of the artworks. Uh, this is on the uh, facade of the Cleveland Museum of Art, where this is all the employees of this museum who donated their signatures and this, this community. This is a community of people living in one building in Utrecht, where, um, which is like a last final island of uh, public housing in the middle of like a privatized uh, public space in the central Utrecht. <coughs> this is, um, this is a, um, a project that also uses like aggregation of, of human behavior, but in this case to produce like a certain model of, um, of a collective Tamagotchi or a, an organism or an animatronic soccer ball in this case. The piece is entitled um, a quasi object, making a reference to uh, Michel Serres' idea of like how certain objects need to be activated as they're circulated between agents. So different movements uh, of soccer balls uh, from games played online by various uh, um, users, uh, internet users were aggregated and um, I don't believe that we can play it, but it's moving, um, actually it's an animatronic piece. Um, um, and finally, the, the series of works that, uh, that I, I realized uh, uh, here at, um, at MIT, they started with a series called Production Line, where I started um, outsourcing my works to human agents, multiplicity of human agents, um, working on this new platform that, in my opinion, is the beginning of the new working class. Um, the platform is called Amazon Mechanical uh, Turk, but there are various similar platforms that exist and they allow for uh, crowdsourced um, uh, labor, uh, people working on small tasks in front of their, their computer screens online um, around the world. And this platform can often, although not always, become exploitative. And, um, but it could also be possibly in the future used for the public good because it allows for collective intelligence experiments and it has been used for some social experiments. So I uh, took advantage of this platform to crowdsource some of the works to thousands of people also working worldwide. And this series is called Production Line where each uh, um, uh, worker uh, was asked to draw a single line and then they were algorithmically uh, kind of uh, fused into these collective drawings that were then outputted as you can see with a pen plotter as a one single line, continuous line, and then, uh, so each drawing kind of up represents an amalgamated labor of, in this case, 500, 1,000, or 2,000 people. Uh, that each line uh, has been uh, drawn in a different part of the world. And what is most important about, about these works um, is that I created a system um, that allows for profit sharing. Uh, so it, in a way, it allows for siphoning off the money from the art market and redistributing it among these workers. So they are participating in the profits and when each of these works sells, they are, they are being paid on the spot as they complete the, their work. But uh, additionally, if the work sells, the, uh, the proceeds are uh, evenly distributed among all the participants because uh, Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk platform allows for uh, storing their IP addresses so we can pay them bonuses at any point in the future if the work sells. Um, <coughs> uh, this is a project that I developed here already at MIT with a generous collaboration from the CSAIL um, um, uh, team. Uh, Lori, Professor Boris Katz, who is present here, and also um, David Mayo and, and Andre Barbu. And uh, this uh, work is entitled um, Assembly Line and continues the idea of how, uh, uh, how to subvert the systems of like the soft exploitation. So in this case, uh, we uh, we worked on the ways in which how people donate uh, the, or volunteer their, their data, their, their bio data online, we transformed it into the ways in which uh, people taking selfies or any kind of uh, uh, self-portraits, how they could be aggregated into a collective self-portrait of this collective worker that this new uh, working class constitutes. So what you're looking at is like an aggregation of um, about 10,000 
people, pho photographs, self-portraits of like 10,000 people uh, that are aggregated into one. And then I, uh, on the basis of several uh, uh, mm, images that we generated um, at CSAIL, I, I uh, mm, created these 3D forms that are these abs abs abstractions um, that represent this collective self-portrait of this society. And uh, this, this project is now evolving further where uh, workers uh, from the same platform are going to put together abstract machines from different machine parts. Uh, and then they will also like uh, be output in various forms. And lastly, I would like to show uh, just one minute of the, of the project that I uh, did here at MIT entitled, entitled Animal Internet. And I collaborated with um, um, Adam Harhowitz, who's present here, as well as um, Agnes Cameron, who I think is also here somewhere, and Owen Trueblood and Ishan um, Gower. And um, uh, it's in many ways like a culmination of all this um, research between non-human intelligence and collective intelligence and artificial intelligence. So what happens here is that um, inspired by the phenomenon of animal internet where um, a lot of scientists are tracking animals all over the world and uh, on the one hand by, by putting chips in animals and that they can be followed digitally but also by placing cameras in jungles or in the North Pole and watching completely wild animals without uh, their knowledge. Um, inspired by this phenomena, I, um, I realized that th since these animals have a kind of hybrid life, because many of them are followed on these webcams, uh, they have web, uh, websites, Facebook pages, and a following of sometimes a couple hundred thousand people. So it creates this kind of hybrid uh, reality between wilderness and, and culture. <coughs> So what we did um, together with the Hacking Arts team is we created um, this uh, project which consists of two real webcams that are broadcasting real uh, wild animals. One is a tiger in the jungle and one is a, a, a polar bear in the North Pole. And we uh, here at MIT built two um, uh, artificial animals. So they are animatronic animals. Uh, we used artificial fur. So no animals were harmed, and this is and and they are uh, basically uh, one of them. The one in the um, upper right corner was powered by um, uh, uh, workers of the Amazon Mechanical Turk that sent as their task for which they were paid. Uh, they sent information about how they were feeling, feeling th whether they were tired, hungry, angry, or relaxed or ha and happy, and this aggregated emotions like through. Um, uh, sentiment analysis and, and uh, the, um, different kind of um, uh, programs that we use and uh, we, uh, we uh, converted into various behaviors of, the, of this uh, fictional animal in a kind of jungle arranged uh, jungle environment. And the other camera is a swarm of um, gerbils which was like in a kind of desert environment and this one is powered by um, a, a Twitter scraper that we wrote. So basically like we were monitoring uh, um, Twitter accounts of all the protest movements in the world and what kind of sentiments they are uh, expressing, whether it's frustration, hope, aggression, um, uh, whether it's positive or negative. And, and, and so this aggregated um, data from different uh, social movements were then powering a, a sugarscape model, an artificial society model uh, that was translated to a collective behavior of this uh, swarm. Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks very much. I wanted, so first of all, I wanted to note, there's, there's five chairs I can see. Please, please come in. You don't even have to sit in the front row. Please, uh, please come and occupy them. Um, and uh, uh, thanks very much, Agnieszka, for, so you, you, you showed some images of your work, you told us about your process and your interests, but I, I wanted to ask one more thing. I wanted to get you to say something about uh, how you work as an artist to do inquiry, specifically, because I've asked the others to respond to this topic, like how the way in which they inquire is different than or similar to artistic inquiry. So can you tell us? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I was hoping that, that, that kind of this was my answer, but of course, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I collaborate with various scientists, okay. but uh, I'm trying for my work not to be illustrative. 
So it's mm -hmm. always somehow twisted. And I really like crossovers between different things that maybe wouldn't cross over in real life and uh, to uh, establish connections or dialogues between sometimes scientists that maybe wouldn't normally meet and wouldn't necessarily be in a dialogue. And uh, even if it leads to miscommunications or errors, but these errors could be um, productive. So, uh, so it's never, you know, although it is a collaboration with, with scientists and other professionals, it, mm -hmm. there's always a, a very strong component of like errorism, as I call it, and, and, and irrationality and, and slippages and just unexpected nonlinear things that can happen. Well, th thanks very much. I think that's very, cons I, I think that that's very consistent with, the, with what you've shown, but you highlighted these two aspects that your work is collaborative it's not just the, the termites who are working together or the slime mold, but, but that uh, you're working collaboratively and you're also um, uh, interested in the unexpected. Uh, so let me ask for uh, perhaps a time. Would you like to? Uh, sure. Um, the next. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Agnieszka, for that display of um, incredible work. Inquiry, that's your question? Yes. How? <laughs> I'm an anthropologist, and so my mode of inquiry is ethnographic fieldwork. And I spend time with people, with collectives, um, and try to figure out what they're doing by doing participant observation, by interviewing them. I've spent a lot of time with scientists in particular, and you know, I bring a set of tools to that inquiry, which are things that, are, that I've gathered from the social theory toolkit which include analytics of gender and race, sexuality, ideas about belief, ideas about conviction, uh, hegemony, practice, ideology, this whole kind of toolkit of things. And the idea is to bring those with me into the zone of inquiry, hanging out with people, and see what they do. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes they can explain things, and sometimes they break. Mm -hmm. And they can't explain things. Or people give me other categories and say, well, no, 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 this is not really about um, whatever you say it's about, really it's about complexity, or really it's about nonlinearity. Since I spend a lot of time studying scientists, I get a lot of that. They say, no, 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 you're, you're saying that this is to do with culture and power, but really it's a scaling problem that's about a certain kind of set of nonlinear dynamics that properly understood as emergent phenomena would reveal X, Y, and Z. You know, and then I can speak back to that and say, well, yes, no. Um, so I, I think part of what um, I have in common with Agnieszka then is that encounter with the unexpected, right? This sort of like a, this empirical work, and then the attempt to sort of to 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 find something and encounter something that is surprising within that. But then also to sometimes you know be assertive about my own categories and say this is patriarchy. What is going on with this Kavanaugh thing at the moment? That is patriarchy. I am not buying it that he's crying. Sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway. This is daughter's prayer. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I know. His daughter's prayer. Uh, yeah. Well, so. th OK. Um, I think, so Caroline was originally signed up to be our respondent. So I think I'll give her the privilege of going last, and I'll give uh, Adam the privilege of going next. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that if it's not um, immediately apparent, I am at an earlier stage of question asking than fellow panelists, so I will try to contribute productive confusion for a few, <laughs> because I am uh, productively confused, perhaps. Um, my background at the moment um, is a mix of neuroscience and art, um, and I, I wanted to touch quickly on, on, on why I think that's a worthwhile mix and why um, it's a contribution to this conversation. Um, I think neuroscience stands out, especially stands out at an institute um, like this, because it is such a uh, unstable meeting ground of objectivity and subjectivity. Um, it is a attempt at a third person study of first person experience with first person experience and it is so contingent and murky. Um, it makes it really exciting to study. It also means that you don't uh, get to stand um, on two stable feet in either uh, the realm of the study of experience or the creation of experience. So um, my interest and excitement about Agnieszka's work and, and, and modes of inquiry were similar um, in that there's a mix of stability and instability. There's a clear picture that comes out of uh, a very uh, murky collection of parts. Um, I'd say that 
uh, something that's really nice in terms of the collective piece that that this sort of subjective object of Nix has has, <coughs> has uh, affected upon me um, is a sense of myself as collective. Uh, I studied um, here uh, a few years ago in the neuroscience department, um, largely neural networks, um, uh, which changed my notion of self as a notion of um, there's a me in a little bit of jelly, and I gotta get it, and I'll get the jelly eventually, to something more like I am um, temporal dynamics, I am rhythm, I am time, I am waves. Um, so the, the movement from uh, functional neuroanatomy um, uh, as, a, as a sort of phrenology to one of instead uh, dynamic networks, myself as collective. And then um, I, I'd, I'd take it even further to um, if, you, if you see something like a, a commiserotomy patient in the neurosciences, somebody who's had um, their hemispheres split, um, something that has stuck with me as a personal collective is um, you might think that when you cut someone's brain in half, it sort of turns off and it, it doesn't. Um, uh, people keep functioning quite well, um, but some develop alien hand syndrome, um, which people might have heard of. Um, but you, you, you develop, um, uh, essentially, hands that disagree. So one might want to button up, one might want to button down. You develop hands that have different information streams to the world. Um, one is more verbal, one may have more sensory motor information. Um, and it's interesting that you can break in that way, but it's also interesting um, that if you were currently broken in that way, broken in terms of being a collective, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know. Um, the notion that introspection as an intentional spotlight is a unifier of many selves, that I might have at the moment, well, I shouldn't poke that, that I might have at the moment um, a more verbal, a younger and older uh, Portuguese speaking and English speaking, a, a, a mix of selves with a mix of knowledges, and that my attentional spotlight is one of those. And so what I see inside is a necessary unification of a possible split collective, um, if that makes sense, has stuck with me in a big way. And that's exciting. Um, uh, I, at the moment, mostly study sleep. Um, which is also a weird way in which people break, very predictably. Um, if you get people at the right state of sleep, um, they will lose syntax, they will pull memories from different parts of their lives that they wouldn't pull when they were awake. They'll be more fluid thinking, they'll be more rigid thinking. Um, I work specifically in a weird sleep state called hypnagogia, and in that sleep state you have a really like deep inversion of an organizing principle to a collective intelligence, which is that when you're awake, as a, as a machine, you're generally, um, I, I, I think, designed to associate two things that are close together and make predictions about the world accordingly. Um, there is a uh, association in my head between water bottle, water drinking, thirst, etc. I'll move towards it when one concept comes up. Um, in hypnagogia, you get a full inversion. Um, it becomes much harder for people to react to things that are closely associated versus associated at long distance. So you have people have faster reaction times when you associate a porpoise and a helicopter than a porpoise in the ocean. Um, and this is exciting to me because it's like, whoa, I'm a collective which I can't introspect on, but I can get down to base rules and switch those base rules and see a different collective in different states, um, if that makes sense, the, the sleeping self versus not sleeping self. So the collective question touches on a lot of things I'm excited about. Um, personal collectives, expanded inactive intelligence, which we'll probably get into later, so I won't get into now, um, and then lastly, excites me because um, the reason that I'm here uh, uh, is that um, Agnieszka and Agnes and Ishan and Tim and many of us and Gary and Lila um, got to collaborate on a, a project in Hacking Arts. And I think that Hacking Arts is a sort of nice demonstration of a certain organizing principle of emergence where I'm not a personal believer in the idea that you can take a bunch of dumb parts and put them together. Um, and get something uh, automatically intelligent without some sort of organizing principle. But I think that hacking arts kind of turns out like that. You just throw a bunch of people who are really different into a room and they kind of bounce off each other. And things pretty predictably come out. And that's really uh, been very exciting for me as a, uh, a, a sort of person who gets to guide that and can't guide that. So I would, um, yeah, I would say that hacking arts um, for me as a collective is um, there's the there's a, uh, I think it's a Kahneman line, there's um, uh, about emergence. Um, oh no, it's Danny Hiller. Uh, uh, it's like, we, we, how can a bunch of stupid things come together and be smart? I'm really interested in hacking arts with how can a bunch of smart things come together and be stupid um, in terms of uh, producing absurdity or getting past utility, um, if that makes sense. Hopefully that's what we do in the night.
All of that to say, um, I am confused by my disciplinary past. I think it's a productive confusion that contributes to the notion of being a confused collective, which is how I introspect upon myself and also how I try to work in the world, um, which is what I think Hacking Arts does, and I think the project did. I think that's why I'm here. So. All right. Thanks very much. Um, <laughs> all right. So Caroline can tell us some about her methods of inquiry and their connection. Well, I'm actually very moved to respond to Adam. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not the gestalt theory that I was taught by Rudolf Arnhardt, right? So I'm really excited that neuroscience is in a place where it can think about dynamic flow and sort of collectivities that split and come back together. I had Lydia bring in this video, which you can watch, and if you um, get bored with me or even if you don't, eventually around about 15 seconds in, 20 seconds in, you'll see the slime mold, social amoeba, form an aggregate. And what's amazing about this unicellular organism that emerges into a multicellular organism is that it does so while each cell maintains its identity, as it were. I mean, it doesn't presumably have consciousness as we hubristically imagine it, but it's um, organizing itself into this slug, which is then going to move off to the left um, as an organized entity looking for food, um, as, a, as a collective that chemically directs itself towards the food that it might be able to sense in its medium. And what's cool about this scientific video is that at the very end of this loop, you'll see this slug become a vertical fruiting body. Okay, so it actually is coming up vertically from the agar plate right here and standing up and going like, okay, I give up, there's no food, I'm going to make spores. I'm going to make spores. And what's um, hilarious about the science of this is that it's attracting people that are just incapable of thinking of this without words like altruism and selfishness and sacrifice and, right. So if you don't get to be a spore, you lose buckwheat, you know, in the, in the science about this kind of material. So, I look to culture as an art historian. I look historically to see what artists have done with certain generative concepts. And in that sense, I'm, I'm very much um, fond of Stefan's toolkit. And we collaborated on some things together with great pleasure. So I look historically at what they've left as traces, you know, texts, images, journals, interviews. And then as a critic in the contemporary world, I work with contemporary artists whose work excites me very much and seems to propel uh, ethnography of the future, if you will. I mean, something coming into being, a kind of emergent thinking that I want to be part of or I want to see in the world. So Agnieszka's presentation was wonderful. Her, her article in um, Cabinet is very interesting about the, I have to read the title, the uncomputables. Um, but where slime mold in her thinking is a kind of model for a certain calculational possibility, I'm actually looking for something else in slime mold. So the artists working with biological material that have taught me things, that have helped me think, are ones that are crafting what I've been calling biofiction. And they've been doing so for, okay, here's the utopian project a cultural evolution that I want to see happen that I'm calling symbiontics. I just use whatever platform I have to tout this stupid neologism. <laughs> the idea of the ontic is that which is, and the idea of symbiosis is that's what we are. We are slime mold. We are completely pathetically dependent on our environment, on our planetary systems, on the scrum of life of which we are a part. And the sooner we can get rid of the fantasy of the selfish individual, the selfish gene, whatever the selfish thing is, the sooner we can get rid of that, the better. The sooner we can think together to sense somehow our complete dependence on the planetary systems that make our, our consciousness and our lives possible, the better, right? So art that does that is art that at the moment 
I, I'm excited by and want to celebrate because I have another fantasy, which I'm sure my anthropologist friend could disabuse me of, that we make art to externalize something that then changes us, right? That then evolves us to a different kind of creature, right? So this is my fantasy. And I celebrate that contemporary art as a place that I don't know how to get to, but they seem to be getting there. They seem to be emerging into that project of collective, I don't want to call it intelligence, collective action, collective sensing, collective being in a chemical bath, which is under theorized, right? The binary bits of neural nets. Forget about the synapse, which is a gap that has to be bridged by wet chemicals, right? So for me, these cultural conversations, these metaphors we live by, are metaphors that will help us possibly live in the future. And if we can't do it, we deserve to be extinct. <laughs> well, that's, that's heartening. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, that, that needed to be heard. And I would say that if, I'm, if I were to be an ethnographer, I would want to be an ethnographer of the future, definitely. Uh, so I appreciate that concept also. Actually, I want to ask, uh, among the, the many topics we have related to neuroscience and biology and the artistic uh, uh, connection to science, um, I wanted to talk about one related to uh, culture and power, uh, uh, specifically that a lot of the formulations of uh, collectivity that we, that we look to, uh, things from, like Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, are uh, pretty hierarchical. Um, even something like uh, Wikipedia, while it isn't uh, modeled in the same way with the uh, payment structure, um, there are uh, definitely hierarchies, and heterarchies at the very least, of power, authority, expertise, um, and, and those are reflected in the content of that. Uh, you know, in many ways, miraculous project, but, uh, but one that has its problems also. Um, are there examples of human collective intelligence that, uh, uh, that you can think of where people um, aren't exerting power over each other, where there is a more genuine uh, form of collectivity, or are there ways in which we're moving toward that? I mean, this may relate, Agnieszka, to you know, uh, your work in uh, um, providing uh, proceeds from art sales to uh, the participants in Amazon Mechanical Turk. But uh, how is it that, uh, that we make a move toward non-hierarchical types of um, collective work among humans? I think it's an interesting question. Um, and one of the reasons why I was fascinated by this research into artificial societies is because this was the first time, I believe, that, that uh, uh, modeling very complex uh, behavior of societies allowed us to understand that any system of this complexity naturally goes into a disequilibrium. So mm. even if you give people equal chances, uh, on the start, it will unless it's monitored constantly. And and uh, the simple, the simple, in my opinion, the simple and short answer to your question is no. There are no systems like this because immediately, unless it's heavily monitored and and supervised, which could pro, uh, which could uh, entail other problems such as uh, surveillance, and then um, it's uh, every system is going to naturally push into some kind of disequilibrium. Um, and, and um, um, kind of disproportionate relations of power. And uh, I'm obviously exploring, and I'm, that's why I'm looking for like various weird phenomena that emerge uh, out of the blue that are really like bottom up emergent processes that sometimes look uh, uh, strange. We don't really know what to make of them. What is their purpose? Some of them are almost have a structure of artworks. There is, there is uh, the, apart from the experiment that I, shown, um, there is an, uh, this experiment, another experiment called Take Care of My Plant, which, I mean, it's, it's kind of absurd. It's like different people, also on Reddit platform, different people were asked to, uh, uh, to participate in like watering this one plant. So they were sending comments uh, through, through a platform and this plant was being nurtured by thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, what is what does this mean? What is the purpose of it? They are just like social. It wasn't even a social experiment. It was something, some emergent action. And I think that you know, there the, the only hope for, for, for me is that looking at spontaneous emergent phenomena in society, of course, including social movements. Mm -hmm. But even these, very often, 
you know, uh, turn to be hierarchical or turn to be, and there's obviously this question of headless revolution, whether it's possible or not, how effective can it be uh, or not? And, and um, I, I, you know, but I think this is why the, the um, it's very interesting to to have this debate with uh, with anthropologists because, like, looking into very strange social phenomena throughout the history of human civilization, maybe can provide some examples. But I am rather skeptical. Could I make a comment on this? Because I think um, the idea of our present models of artificial intelligence as being somehow exemplary is deeply flawed because each of those are based on code that gets handed on and passed on and is totally baked into hierarchies of when it was built. You know, there's even junk in there that's like, you know, chat, you know? So I'm informed by the work of like Wendy Chun, who's a great media theorist, who traced back the homophily algorithms of Facebook, right? If you like this, you like if Amazon, if you like this, you'll like this, right? The so-called echo chamber that we find ourselves in socially to a pioneering study in the 1950s by an urban theorist, right? And Nick probably knows all of this and remembers the guy's name. Anyway, it was two paradigms mm -hmm. of which only one was chosen for the future development of all sorting algorithms. The two paradigms were birds of a feather live together, sort mm -hmm. together, and the other urban study of neighborhoods was opposites attract. These two bits of difference liking and difference hating sort completely differently, and the one that software developers chose was homophily, was birds of a feather always want to flock together. That's because they weren't in a dream state. They couldn't think of the opposite <laughs> thing that was far apart. It's because they were, they were living they in the 50s the when redlining was happening, <laughs> you know, redlining was happening in their neighborhoods. They were already whites who were benefiting from that privilege, you know what I'm saying? So even though the urban study guy wanted to look at the non-racist model, that's not what got baked into all of our systems. So I, as a culturalist and a historian, want to insist that there is nothing neutral about the intelligences as we now define them. And when I was privileged to be at a session with Danny Hillis, you know, um, on you know, possible minds with a bunch of robotics people who now have second thoughts. Like, oh, you know, what about AI? It's kind of scary, actually. Anyway, I said, guys, what about the immune brain? You know, it learns, it teaches us, it remembers things, it forgets things, it's distributed, it's not exactly conscious. Maybe it is, we don't really know. The point is, it works both to take in and to reject. And the fact that all we spend our money on is antibiotics and that probiotics aren't even regulated by our federal drug authority tells us something about how our root algorithms are organized. Right? So I'm, I'm looking for different metaphors mm -hmm. to get going, and I'm looking to art for doing that. So. Um, well, if there's more to say on this, we can, but uh, there, there's also other Hierarchies, power, gender? Yeah, there's more to say on this. There's something. Particularly if there's anything helpful. I I don't know if I'd add something hopeful, but I might add something rhizomatic or more linky than noty in terms of hierarchy setups. I think that the sort of AI is scary take is is interesting. I think. Also, that the way that AI is changing us and the way that we see technology is a sort of different conversation which gets left out sometimes in terms of um, how is it that we're relating to those sorting algorithms and how are they changing us as information processors and packers. And um, Something I, I wanted to add, um, which might, might be interesting in a higher ed conversation, is um, transactive memory um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of linking concept, meaning um, culture, um, as a form of collective memory that no one person holds. Uh, and the notion that I, as an individual in a culture, don't need to remember necessarily the history of when this space was burned or built. I need to remember the person who remembers the history. Um, and the, the notion that that sort of linking is being extended to such a great degree with current information sorting becoming so effective, where 
Um, I, I know, not only do I not need to know where the, uh, uh, when, when the house was built or, or, or burned, I, I, I barely need to remember the person who remembers the name of the house. And um, as you get more effective linking in this way, I think you start to live more in the links rather than in the nodes of information. Um, so I think the interesting thing about it, um, in, in my lab we do some work on uh, tech and memory, and there's really nice work showing uh, that as you, for instance, uh, teach people uh, about Wikipedia pages, um, they stop remembering the content and they start remembering how to find the content. Um, they move towards the, the links. I think that I see this um, in myself and things like family history, in myself like working in a lab with distributed kinds of expertise, right? I don't really feel like I need to know much about circuits because there's a person next door who knows a lot about circuits. Um, I'm really curious about the kind of uh, uh, hierarchy that's turning me into um, and what it means if I live more <coughs> in links to information and less in terms of nodes, less in terms of expertise, less in terms of that sort of hierarchy, um, and what it means to start forgetting the things and remember the, remembering the paths to the things, forgetting the name of the things. Yeah, just a thought. So, well, l let, me, let me move on to another question to which the answer may also just be no. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm wondering, with the, uh, because you're characterizing uh, so many things as collective, right? We're talking about this, the self, the mind, um, uh, Marvin Minsky, of course, uh, had this uh, uh, concept of society of mind, uh, which uh, you know metaphor, uh, uh, makes a metaphor to uh, the neural activity and the brain in, in terms of society. Uh, obviously, there's the, the collective nature of society, and there's particular online labor platforms. Um, there's collaboration also, uh, artistically and scientifically and otherwise. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is whether it's useful to distinguish what is it redundant to just say collective intelligence? Is there another kind of intelligence? Um, does it, is there a reason that we would even say that to, to put an emphasis on something? What are we distinguishing it from? I'm not sure if this is also part of the question that you, that, that we were um, discussing earlier about the distinction between intelligence yeah. and, and, and creativity. Which is, yeah. I think that these two questions are related and I think that it, in principle, in my opinion, it's a false binary because uh, um, any uh, kind of uh, creativity involvement, intelligence, uh, and vice versa. Mm. And it was uh, a lot of this uh, conversation about creativity versus intelligence was actually generated by neoliberal discourse, Richard Florida, and and, and uh, exploitation of this creative intelligence for for um, purposes of of, um, of corporations, for example. Um, and and yeah. I think that this whole binary is, is completely false. Um, but uh, what, for example, is interesting for me um, in terms of, of collective intelligence um, and why I think that it's, um, it's important to distinguish it, even if it's a pleonasm, maybe, uh, uh, is the fact that, uh, especially culture, but especially Western culture mm -hmm. uh, in particular, has this uh, tradition of thinking about um, intelligence as individual and and located in the brain mm -hmm. and and human? And I really appreciate what Caroline was was saying. I, I, I absolutely share your interest in this realm. That this has to this uh, anthropomorphization of intelligence and and the idea of like this uh, individual intelligence mm -hmm. it has to stop because not only obviously scientists are observing since a long time that intelligence is distributed that it's external to the brain, uh, and it can be collective, it can be also non-human. And, uh, and intelligence essentially is alien, I would even say, in a, in a way, and especially with the microbiome research uh, uh, that is both inside of our, our bodies, but also is mm -hmm. external in a way, so it's both us and on us. And, and uh, I think that, that it actually brought the whole conversation, and, and coming back to, to, to the things we, we said here about AI, the, the whole anthropomorphization of, of, of uh, artificial intelligence, that it's, 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 a, it's a single brain, or it's a single entity, or a robot, or something. It's, it's just like a, such a blind alley, because uh, there are actually all these other forms of intelligence that, and in, and in fact, which corresponds to neural networks, which is uh, used by, which are used by scientists, 
that it is a multiplicity. It's a network. It's a collective. So it's useful to ask who is served by the fiction mm -hmm. of yeah. the solitary unit. And, you know, the market is very well served by this. Yes. So uh, the ICA just opened a beautiful show with Jason Moran, and their stated intention was to sort of break with the art world's fixation on the individual and talk about collaboration, mm -hmm. but it's called Jason Moran. You know what I mean? So they, they can't really get there because they're inside, they're inside the art market, but they know they want to get there, right? So you, just, you can just see the function of these ideologies as they, yeah. as they operate. So, I mean, yeah, so, so one, one thing we could come to with the term collective intelligence, perhaps also like situated or distributed intelligence, is, is that it, it doesn't mean that there is another kind. It means that we need to explain something about the nature of intelligence by adding, by adding these terms. We need to, we need to adjust our, uh, our appraisal of them. Well, and back then, to yeah. Adam's point, um, there's also the, the binary with dumb, right? Mm -hmm. So, we, I mean, we function with that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, Nick didn't want to talk about this, but like MIT has a whole center for collective intelligence. And what they're trying to do over there at the Sloan School is actually not be dumb, not have algorithms determine our president, for example. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and that is a very important project, even though it operates within all the hierarchies with all the biases that, you know, could possibly cook into all this. At least there are some humans that are trying to, you know, move yeah, yeah, yeah. move the the debate within things that we have already unleashed, right? That are already operating in fairly stupid ways to, to run our social lives. I, I want everyone to talk about what they want to talk about. By the way, can I just want to say yeah. <laughs> I just want to quickly add. I think that um, what Professor Jones said about uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, about moving from uh, emergent intelligence to emergent being. Um, I think it's a really interesting, interesting comment if um, smarter is what we're trying to be when we group together or not. Um, uh, there's, there's nice research um, out of MIT, old, I think it was Malone, and then more, more recently it's Sandy Pentland, at Media Lab, um, doing work on what it is that predicts uh, effective collaboration. And it is, um, it's, 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 never, uh, it's never picking an individual member to be um, smarter than the rest of the group and talk more, or even three within 10. Um, it's always a measure of social cohesion. That's the best predictor of output. Um, and I think that that's research that, that people have come across and has been around for a while. There's more recent research, which I think is interesting in, in, in what President Jones just said about our, our, our country making collective decisions, which we question, um, which is that, that that measure of social cohesion is no longer a good measure of group output um, if those people are not in person, if they're communicating over uh, text on the internet, um, then that, that is no longer the measure that predicts group intelligence as it was measured in, in the original uh, Malone work. Um, I, I find that um, pretty scary in terms of the ways that we're going to relate at scale. Um, and so I, I really appreciate uh, the move from emergent intelligence to emergent um, being, whether intelligent is what we're aiming for and whether intelligent is what we're actually studying. I think it's really exciting that 100 ants on a flat surface walk in a circle and die and 500,000 can see the world. Um, but I don't know if what they're doing is being intelligent. Uh, I think it's cool to complicate. So let me ask, this is because the topic has come up about um, authorship, one might say, but also uh, um, being an artist as a singular you know, type of activity, the, 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 the myth of, uh, uh, of the uh, individual author, the individual um, artist, as, um, as something that's, that's promulgated, I mean, copyright law coming about to be able to uh, uh, put, uh, uh, um, make work marketable. And of course, um, the art world has its, has its own version of this also. It's not just in publishing, right? Um, so, it's actually the case that this work arises even if it's not done by uh, explicitly by collaboratives, even if it's not uh, even if it's not Shakespeare working out his play with a troupe of actors, and you know, uh, uh, or someone with editorial uh, supervision uh, and, and collaboration. Um, uh, it occurs in the social context. It occurs collectively in various ways. 
And I think we, we recognize that, uh, that the standard individual uh, intelligence, individual creativity model is, uh, is an outmoded one. But uh, then I guess the question is what's going to happen with it? Uh, will, will there, is, there, is, 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 is this going to increasingly be recognized by uh, the communities that have a stake in this? Or is, is, is there going to be pushback and, and uh, you know, further assertion? What, where, where do you see it going in the future? <laughs> our, our ethnographer of the future at the end of the table. Well, I think the art world will be the last to go. Um, so I'm fascinated by artists who have some experience with, say, the theatrical arts or the mm -hmm. music world, like Jason Moran, right? There are very well elaborated, controlled systems of credit and sharing mm -hmm. in those worlds, even down to jazz improvisation, you know, where it's like, it's your turn, the drummer, you know? Um, the second you get into the art world, right, everything changes. So uh, an artist like William Kentridge, who loves opera, who wishes he could just do opera, mm -hmm. needs to go over here and make a drawing and sell it for $300,000 so he can make an opera, right? Because opera doesn't make money. Opera is collaborative. Opera has many, many people working on it, all of whom get paid and are given credit, right? So ironically, the thing he can do himself is paid more by the art world than the thing that has to pay all those other people. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that obscures the fact that his workshop has a stable of very committed people that he has worked with sure, sure. almost in a theatrical troupe impresarial way for decades. And, and they don't, their name does not go on the drawing. But let me ask, so I understand this from the credit perspective, but let right. me ask this, isn't some of the value, maybe most of the value of art, that we can talk about it and we can share our appreciation of it, our understanding, our reflection on it? And doesn't that come from knowing about artists and their practices? And if we, if we have something, I mean, we, we Agnieszka's work is interesting because we know about her, her trajectory yeah. as an artist and the, the contextual, the contextual uh, uh, situation of the other works that she's done and her thinking and her perspective and the way that she inquires. Right? I think and her work is unusual the in the amount of credit that she shares yes. and the discussion of her collaborators. I think that's unusual and I think that's admirable. But we have to admit we're not as interested in her Turker's stories as we are in her. But that could be a great hypnagogic <laughs> reversal. <laughs> that could be a great hypnagogic <laughs> reversal. Instead of averaging yeah. those emotions. Yeah, it's absolutely. You know, yes. um, sure. uh, right? Drilling down and, and there is some, you know, there is some effort to do that. There is some work with these mm -hmm. affective communities. Um, I think, you know, I'll just throw out another example of collectives, which I would love to get Agnieszka's response to. So in Dafen, which is the special economic zone of Shenzhen, the art village was collected by the part party state in China mm -hmm. and told that they should each paint their dream on, the, on this particular canvas. But on the other side, they should paint an exact replica of this thing over here, this little chip, this little photographic chip. And they're very highly skilled at replicating photographic mm -hmm. information on whatever they're given. And when all of the tiles were put together by the party state, they made a giant Mona Lisa. Not from their dreams, which are now on the back of the canvas, their individual dreams, but the front, which they were given as actual living human mechanical turkers, yeah. now composes the Dauphin Mona Lisa, which is so much better than Leonardo's because we all made it together, yeah. right? <laughs> so this, this trope of the collective is also a cultural conceit, yeah. mm -hmm. and it bears with it tremendous power yeah. for the political narrative, right? So the hierarchy that determined which worker would get which shit, you know, which piece of the Mona Lisa is erased in the discourse about this wonderful collective, mm -hmm. right? So you, you know you can always do that interesting analysis of the history and how it works with these concepts. Um, the name of the mechanical Turk is an obscene Orientalism, right? That we just use without reflection, but it already encodes the hierarchy of this automata 
without brain that will perform upon demand. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, can we reverse that narrative in any way with that platform? I mean, I think we'd have to rename it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, I mean, I'm I, not I sure the other platforms are better, though. Yeah, <laughs> because um, there are. Yeah, yeah. 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 crowd lower <laughs> is the yeah. other. Uh, that's, 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 crowd so, so it does well, seem like yeah. historicizing these terms is one way to kind yeah. of break them, right? That the history of the collective and collective farming in the former right. Soviet mm -hmm. Union is a different kind of right. collective yeah. than yes. the kind of utopian thing that maybe we're talking about a little bit here, right? Yes. And I think a lot of discussions of collective intelligence are, and emergent intelligence are haunted by a kind of reductionist methodological individualism, mm -hmm. right? That somehow there is this collective emanation of emergent intelligence, and then it's made of these binary little bits called right. indivi individuals, mm -hmm. which is kind of Western liberal contract theory from mm -hmm. Hobbes to Rousseau to John Locke, et cetera, um, Leibnizian monads that just sort of percolate, right, with no, me with no mediating the middle structure, right? I think that maybe that's, that's something we could think about, is what would be a meso theory? You know, there's something that intervenes between the kind of monads and this collective effervescence. Well, let's right. go there, because the monad <laughs> is merely an invagination or an extrusion mm. from a single divine body. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we could, get right there with the <laughs> monad, we could, we could get some fuzz and mm -hmm. some vagueness and some sliding going on. It's, it's the bit that I think we, we struggle, mm -hmm. we struggle with. Right. I would have two comments uh, to, 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 to this um, exchange. One is about uh, uh, coming back again about uh, to this uh, question of like creativity and, and pr different projections and anthropomorphizations of, of AI and its uses and, and um, uh, the, the something that is specific I think um, about uh, uh, mm, um, uh, um, intelligence that is not machining is a certain aspect of irrationality or unpredictability or uncomputability. Um, and um, uh, I think that the problem that, that is now uh, starting to be recognized by, by scientists that it's this tendency to anthropomorphization but also of, of the AI and, and um, trying to think about how this could be creative and how could we, for example, create an artificial intelligence artist using algorithms. I mean, the, the, the one of the questions is like, how do you actually um, imitate, um, uh, not the intelligence, but precisely the dominance, the stupidity, or to think even more broadly, uh, some kind of irrationality of various kinds, including stupidity, um, or naive terror, or, and this is becoming, a, I mean, it's probably like an unbridgeable yeah. challenge. But machines have their own type of stupidity. It's called glitch. It's yeah, called glitch. That can be employed yeah. in these yes. kind of things. So but they are different they don't have glitches. To imitate, they don't have to imitate human uh, Agreed, but you know, there are different art. kind of <laughs> errors and glitches. And of course, some artists are exploring these glitches, yes. machining glitches. But actually, the kind of irrationality, there is something uh, particular um, about it. And, and I, I think that, uh, you know, the um, the un, um, the un uncomputability of like collective social behavior, which we can obviously now with all the algorithms that we have at hand to, for example, we, uh, um, anticipate the the, uh, the election results and other uh, other phenomena that become useless at the end of the day because so many rational factors sometimes play into it. I think that uh, you know I see. I mean, I kind of see some hope in it because wouldn't it be absolutely terrifying and everything could just be computed and, and we would be able to anticipate everything like in terms of any kind of uh, creative, excuse the, the word, process of any kind, not in mm -hmm. culture, but in any, I think actually this would, uh, you know, uh, um, humans uh, uh, need not only this um, sense of uh, uh, being able to control things because obviously what is, uh, calculate uh, the ability to calculate things. It's obviously connected to our ability con to control things. And the more that, uh, that we have all the un uncomputables and irrational uh, factors, this actually, I mean, the, the fact that we still can have it, thank God, is uh, actually a, a positive thing. Uh, but m I don't know for how long, but I'm hoping that maybe, maybe always. Um, but, um, and another point that I wanted to make about um, the, the questions of authorship and, mm -hmm. and like where, are, where art and culture could go. I mean, one of my main 
uh, areas of research is, uh, research is where is culture going to evolve, where it's going. And I, I think that we're living in, uh, for many uh, um, um, reasons, um, horrifying times, but for other reasons, very interesting times, because we can witness as culture evolves in front of our times, uh, in front of our eyes, because it's, some things are happening so uh, fast. But one uh, negative um, 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 aspect of evolution of culture is that it used to be produced collectively and things like the Bible or the mythologies were uh, important products of culture with multiple anonymous, mostly anonymous um, uh, authors and even today like a lot of people are indicating that even constructs like Homer or maybe to some degree even Shakespeare actually constitute a multiplicity of, or certain diversity of more than just one author. And at some point of uh, cultural evolution, we arrived at a point where basically, yes, as um, Caroline p pointed out, cultural industries or proto-industries proto capitalized on the fact that if you have a singular author, it's going to be easier to capitalize on it, to market it, to, mm -hmm. to, to, and, uh, and we're, yeah, and we're like uh, at the point of total absurd of this, that, that it's uh, a total alienation almost of the product. Uh, um, and the, the and I think that cr uh, you know creativity uh, uh, is a social relation uh, first and foremost. And what happened in culture is that creativity became a relation between the product and the author. And I think and and this is why you know uh, uh, precisely as Carolyn was uh, uh, pointing out that um, uh, that the. Uh, you know the objects that had uh, were touched by the artist's hand. Why is painting today, as for example, like uh, Isabella Grau very interestingly analyzes, like why has painting been so fetishized and and uh, is re uh, reaching the highest prices? Is because the the um, a lot of people who understand culture in a kind of very basic way they want to have the the the, the stigma of the artist, the touch of the artist's hand, even if it's mechanized to some degree, but still some kind of expanded notion of painting or expanded mm -hmm. notion of sculpture, mm -hmm. something that had a contact with the living body of the artist. And, and it's obviously just another, you know, like commodification of a process that, that uh, originally was, uh, you know, general intellect, multitude of various, of various people. But uh, let, me, let me ask though, because it seems to me that there, it is possible, as you're mentioning with regard to, to Homer, the, the, yes. the, the Odyssey author, um, that we can have works that don't have an author and that are uh, uh, creative and uh, uh, influential socially, um, uh, but we can't have something creative or influential socially without uh, some type of cultural context for it. The, we, we wouldn't say that we wouldn't say, "Oh, this is a very creative meteorite that landed on the ground." You know, I mean, it, it's it, it's it's a, it has to be a work that has some meaning situated socially. That's that's there, and so th that, that I don't know if it looked like Agnieszka's sculpture. You might, you might say, what a creative-looking meteorite. <laughs> yes, that's well, true. <laughs> yes, yes. In other words, if it had certain orders that yes. we associate, but there was a, there was also cultural the selection intelligence materials. There was also an arrangement of. Um, but know, upon first contact, if it rockets out of the sky and lands in front of you, and it looks like her, yes. anodized. <laughs> Metal well, this, thing. this would be this. This is an empirical question. If we went to, if we if we go to the uh, Museum of Natural History and we um, take one of the meteorites and we put it in an art gallery, you know, oh, it's been done. Oliver, <laughs> Oliver, <laughs> Oliver Lyson already did that. But I'm making a different point about where culture comes from. Sure, right? sure. So if it rockets out of the sky, it lands in front of us, and it looks like Agnieszka's object. I'm going to say there's probably some culture in this, mm -hmm. right? So I'm supplying. Yes. You know, I'm part of the what I love what Adam mentioned about this collective sure, sure. project that defers memory and stores it in other people and so on and so forth. I mean, maybe it would be a provocative suggestion to say are we allowing corporations to have collective intelligence? They're already fictive persons, they're already fictive bodies, you know. Um, what what are we, you know, we have many, many entities in our own culture that are kind of allowed to operate as if they possessed intelligence. And some of the AI crowd I was hanging out with was saying that this is already the singularity. This is already an artificial intelligence. Their claim is that the CEO 
has to listen to this aggregate that is this corporation. That the CEO is a fictive individual who doesn't actually control what's going on with this emergent property, which is called the capitalist corporation. So I take that pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there's a history to that. Right? There's a history to so that. We decided to make them people. We decided to let them have free speech. We decided to let them you know, have certain ways of storing their capital and moving it around. Uh, that didn't involve our, our separate wishes. So, you know, some have argued that this is already the singularity of, an, of a general intelligence mm -hmm. appearing in, in our social organizations. I'm thinking, I'm we thinking could learn back. their language and have conversations with them to ask them to treat us nicely. I think that's <laughs> called a chat room. I, I think I do that on my interfaces. I'm also up. thinking back to the 19th century and Charles Babbage's notion of yeah. intelligence as not only a kind of capacity or faculty, but also as knowledge about the conduct of calculation. Mm -hmm. And Charles Babbage not only being famous for thinking about early theory and computation, but also mm -hmm. somebody who is very interested in factory manufacture and in organizing right. the shop floor right. and making the claim that having the knowledge about how to organize the shop floor meant having intelligence and the intelligence resided not in the craftspeople or in the factory workers on the floor, but rather in the manager. Right? So already there, there's a kind of notion of, there's already a kind of relation of production that produces a kind of a notion of what counts as intelligence. And it's gathering together of a collectivity into kind of the category mistake of the individual. Can I, I, I just want to add quickly to the point of uh, uh, irrationality and authorship and incorporation. Um, I think another, uh, institution uh, project directive that's at the table um, and in the room, uh, the, the, the sort of collective scientist and the collection of facts that science produces and the notion of authorship in that realm I think is really interesting. I think um, in my experience there's almost an opposing um, problem, which is that um, in my experience the art world, art um, rarely exists without an author. In my experience of science and scientific discussions about how memory does or doesn't work or is split or not split or stays or doesn't stay, um, facts are split from their producers. Um, and I think this is interesting um, to Professor Jones's point in terms of uh, power in code. Also, um, the notion of math or of software as neutral and without author. Um, and then in the science world, the notion of facts as without author and what that produces um, and, and, and why that comforts us. I think it eliminates subjects and the limitations of specific cohorts of subjects. It eliminates the scientist as subjective, it eliminates the study of myself as study of other, which I think is comforting as a construction of objectivity and a way to study ourselves or know ourselves factually. But I think um, in the same way there's an interesting psychology of the artist as always author or science as without author, uh, sort of ex nihilo science. Um, there's an interesting psychology to why I think it's comforting to consider uh, myself or ourselves or uh, uh, intelligence as a collective um, in that it lets you uh, understand and not understand at once and that's okay where you can say we can boil down to parts and I can see the parts and so I'm a materialist scientist and that is comforting but at the same time there's a sort of weak epiphenomenalism um, where you can say those parts construct a mystery and that leaves some space for free will or soul or whatever you'd like to put in there um, so I think the psychologies of all of these are really interesting the, the psychology of uh, giving personhood to corporation, the psychology of giving perhaps too much personhood to an art project, or perhaps taking personhood out of a scientific project. Ooh. Well, I think we should break the hermetic seal around the five of us and see if there's uh, some questions from uh, our attending audience that have uh, been so kind to uh, to. We'll be voting them up and down over here. We'll be voting your questions up. Um, Let's, let's, uh, yes. Hi, uh, what do you say, uh, MIT Center of Political Activism and I asked on the other question number, uh, comments. <laughs> like, the ones, uh, this is coming. the one that I really uh, did not hear from him yet, how this man or how he finds uh, intelligence. Hmm. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the things that I was wondering is uh, if uh, intelligence and creativity would be considered distinctly 
um, as some people in, uh, for instance, in computational creativity like to think of creativity as being distinct from artificial intelligence, the way that problem solving behavior is treated there. So Agnieszka's perspective was was not, was that they shouldn't be thought of separately. What's, um, what's intelligent to you? I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer to the ethnographer. I'm interested in the actors categories. So my main question with the slime mold is, what is this thing that you mean when you say the word intelligence, right? So mostly I wanna ask that question, not answer it. Right, so I think that, you know, the, the emerging ideas of art and culture that I see us celebrating in some way as some demi, hemi, semi collective up here is to question the, the computational motherboard as the metaphor for intelligence, right? The Babbage manager, the uh, man behind the curtain, the, you know, homo ratiomatics or whatever Lena called it, right? The kind of gubernator, you know, the, the, the cybernetic steersman, right? To kind of question that and to say that it's time to acknowledge that other things are happening. Things that seem to have purpose and form and, and seem to push things into being that are not necessarily driven by some rational intelligence at the center. So do we want to abandon the word or do we want to retool it? That's kind of the project, that's the question at hand. I'm not sure which is, maybe it's fatally compromised. It certainly has its sociological and racist baggage. So maybe we, you know, but again, there's a market there as well, right? When I wanted to get some digitized images for teaching, I got nowhere with the library. They didn't have any money. But when I called it an IS&T problem, and I called it an information management problem, suddenly I had all these people saying, we'll write some software for that. <laughs> right? So they thought they could sell an intelligent system of digital, like they kind of forgot PowerPoint existed, but they thought they could sell an intelligent teaching platform. The library didn't have anything to sell. It just had all this collective memory, MIT gives it a budget. Yeah. You know, so this is, you know, there's also a market in intelligence. So I, I think that I think for one thing that, that your definition is, is contextually suggested. So in, in many ways, uh, at MIT, um, uh, what intelligence is is a sort of back formation from artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, if we were and a back we were, formation there from cybernetics, if we were in government, which were military <laughs> guidance systems. Well, right? if we were in government and political science, we would think that intelligence maybe right. was gathering satellite and uh, human intelligence uh, data from places and trying to integrate it to learn things about other countries and actors, right? So, right. and at MIT, it's also a techno scientific category, right? Yes. And that's the tool with which that's the discourse with which to approach it, right? Right. Rather than intelligent design. Right. Right. Rather than right. the tools of a particular religious cosmology. Right. That's why I'm trying to push this uh, uh, the conversation uh, uh, in, within my work, my, my questions that I'm asking myself, um, as uh, far away from any uh, anthropomorphization or uh, um, human associated, but also machining into other realms, into alien intelligence, into into uh, microbial intelligence, into uh, non-organic uh, intelligence, mm -hmm. like intelligence of particles, because I think that one of the problems is that we uh, associated all this, uh, the, I, I think a lot of these notions were exactly created kind of uh, on the basis of, of certain cliches that, that um, emerged uh, in various fields. And we have to take it somewhere into, for me, in one word, like the intelligence, like if it really something is, is the unknown, you know, like the, some, the, 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 something that is 
uh, I'm looking for it in the unknown, the irrational, the uh, otherworldly. Uh, and so because other, all these other categories, we've kind of, uh, I feel almost like hit the wall. And it's just. Um, hmm. Go maybe oh, I, go, I was I was going to see if we could have, have one have maybe one or two more questions, but is, is there a question? Yeah. There was one in back. Yes. I'm sorry, so can you, can you it's a question that? as to whether we have new discoveries on slime molds, which I must admit I do not. <laughs> I, I um, have some. <laughs> but, but I mean, Aska may may be able to. I, I don't know. Maybe you, 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 you came up with like to the talk, but I was showing an image of slime mold solving a maze. Most recently, I mean, what was established about the slime mold is that it has a me memory. It's capable of collectively memorizing, which uh, kind of also refers to the question about intelligence, because of course, like you know. Uh, uh, um, remembering and learning. It has a ca capability of learning, uh, even though it doesn't have a nervous system. So it's in a way it's similar to a neural network that, it's, that it somehow learns. And um, I, I have a book to recommend, which is uh, there's a professor at Princeton who has spent his life with these organisms, kind of along the model of the wonderful Japanese researcher who presented them to the emperor in 1930 as the model of a good society. Anyway, the guy at Princeton's last name is Bonner, and the book is just called The Social Amoeba. And it's um, beautifully illustrated, it's small, it's lovely to read. Um, and, he, and he talks about all the things that are known and the much larger things that aren't known about how this um, creature organizes. And you know, it's in the family of fungi, right? We don't know much about fungi. They are everywhere, and they are, the plants are down here in the evolutionary line. You know, animals are here in the evolutionary line, and fungi are, you know, they're kind of right up there. They're, um, they're, they act collaboratively. They, they provide communication channels for other symbiotic creatures that they're involved in, for plant, you know, trees, and I mean, so, like, stay tuned, because the fungi <laughs> yeah. are, are giving us a lot of the chemical signaling that is just beginning to be seen as intelligent. Yeah. I, I, I want to ask, though, about the idea that the repetition of previous states and, and shapes, that we, we call this uh, memory. I mean, we all, I, you could also have a memory foam pillow that does this, and we wouldn't attribute it with the, the intelligence. In fact, the fact that our computers have memory um, is not the way that Babbage, of course, talked of them. He talked of uh, not the processor and memory, but the mill and the store, mm -hmm. right? So he had the industrial metaphor for computing, and our computer would be spoken of much more like in, in, in these factory terms, um, except for the fact that it was later reframed as a giant brain. Mm -hmm. and, right, but uh, we have gigabytes of storage. So the store, yes, yes. No, the store I mean, does th th these, get these aren't there. the only metaphors. Right. But I'm saying that, that we uh, often project <coughs> into into these concepts yeah. metaphorically, and it's uh, and and so um, not that not that slime molds aren't interesting. I'm not trying to assert that in this <laughs> crowd, definitely. But but I, I, I we should also be thinking about what we are yeah. figuratively discussing and what we're what we're projecting onto them by. Absolutely. I mean, they're not the only social. There, the name's social. What yeah. does that mean? I mean, does that make any sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, is there? A, yes. Yeah. Um, it seems like some of the ways we have right now of acknowledging and respecting this sort of collective intelligence or this act of producing something collectively is like profit sharing and credit sharing and. Um, things along those lines, but I feel like thinking about the cases of acting in a collective with termites or acting in a collective with artificial intelligence kind of shows the limits of approaching it that way. So what might it look like to really, what's the equivalent of profit sharing with artificial intelligence or with termites? What's, I'm, I'm sure I understood the question. What is um, the equivalent of profit sharing? What's in it for the termites? Yeah, yeah, what's in it for the termites? What's in it for the termites? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, the, actually, I have to say, honestly, I 
unconsciously used the termites as a model of soft uh, of soft exploitation because the termites they do, you know it's this kind of like uh, uh, interesting phenomenon that they are almost blind they don't see what they are building out of for example they don't see that these are these crazy colors instead of like the gray or, or orange black mud and it was just like a really for me interesting vehicle to talk about soft exploitation it's like how our data is exploited or like you know uh, how I, I have to point out they weren't even invited to the opening <laughs> <laughs> But, but I mean, to kind of develop further on your question, you know, like obviously, uh, you know, a question that I'm being asked uh, very often is like, okay, so you're talking about this collective intelligence and, and a collective authorship, but at the end of the day, you're just like a single author. And, uh, you know, one of the things that interests me, I, I think that this uh, questions of author, singular authorship, we're really witnessing some sort of erosion of, of the singular author. But it's not that we're already, I don't really know, this is one of my, areas of inquiry, where is it going to go? I just know that individual authorship is kind of, you know, uh, uh, eroding. And we can see it already in science, we can see it in knowledge production. In uh, individual arts, as Car Caroline uh, pointed out, it, it, they will be the last to go, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. But, uh, you know, for example, when you look at science, how a Nobel Prize uh, used to be just given to a single person. More recently, there is, there is a kind of uptick there because more recently, not only is given to groups of, of, uh, the, of people, sometimes a team of three, two, three, four scientists, uh, but also, more interestingly, it's given simultaneously to two or three people who discovered the same thing in different parts of the world. And I think that this is an interesting uh, development that you know may may lead to something else, and also uh, in the field of culture. But we may wait for we may not be witnessing this. I just think that something is changing, and I'm I'm happy to be witnessing this. But where it's gonna go, I don't know. Yeah, and I might just add that if you want to see the models of profit on the animal kingdoms and the fungal kingdoms, I mean. You know, brewer's yeast was the first animal to be, I mean, the first fungi to be sequenced. It is the origin of the word biotechnology, the brewer's yeast. So we've been kind of exploiting, you know, these branches for a long, long time. And what's interesting is that humans reflect on these practices. So humans are saying, well, it was fine to have a couple of pigs, but 7,000 in a windowless container? Is that fine? So. You know, in my own work, I'm, I'm interested in these modes of visibilization and the fact that we create architectures with no windows because some part of our culture is nervous that the question, what's in it for the pigs, is going to come up, right? When we're just, you know, we've engineered them to have six months lifespans where they triple in size on particular kinds of feed. You know, I mean, we, we, we're producing them as machines to feed us. And so the, the question of ethics of these relationships, you know, it's being addressed, but in very personalized ways that fit with neoliberalism. Did you eat a hamburger today? Right? Rather than, what is our collective responsibility to this planet and to the life forms? Should we always maximize human life? I mean, is that our ethical organization? Right. So these questions of the collective are still pressing and make me want to cry because we need to have these conversations all the time. We need to talk. So I really value your question. Uh, well, I, I do as well. Caroline, I think that one of the things about it is that it, it also brings the question down to the specifics of you know, how do we collaborate, right. uh, not, not, not how do we solve every global problem related to right. industrial agriculture and, and uh, you know, uh, any, an ecological disaster and so on. But how is it that uh, we, in our own practices, um, could be fair to um, crowdsource labor that we employ? Uh, but how do we think about this in relationship to machine, to other sort of machine, animal, you know, unusual collaborations? But how do we situate that in what we might do as um, people working in art science, or as uh, as others thinking about those types of collaborations? Yes. Uh, so the kind of historical perversion of the anemic and cultural currency is maybe a way to borrow from Simone Brown, you know, the sort of 
challenging, but he purchased things from the Amazon where they eat day. So uh, I know that Jeff Bezos' son goes here, so if, if I were to bump into him, what would you recommend we pass along as a renaming of the mechanical <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, distributed automata? I don't know. Do you have an idea? I'm, I'm pretty excited in terms of uh, the power of reframing these different metaphors for work and these different metaphors for intelligence and how that lets you reframe the person who asks the questions. I'm super excited about, about bungle networks and mushrooms. Um, I would like probably go ask, I don't know if you've come across Paul Stamets, but he lectures on mushrooms while wearing a mushroom as a hat and is an inspiring creature. Um, I, yeah, I, I would probably knock on his door and ask what he means by intelligence. Um, a sort of intelligence which uh, makes up the world's largest and the world's oldest organism, and which forms a sort of intelligence that creates a forest over hundreds of years. Um, I think offers a lot of challenges uh, to the sort of um, uh, single author versus collective forest question, and offers a lot of challenges to the short-term profit versus long-term world uh, question. So I, I added mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Good mushroom things also. But you're asking about different kinds of framings and language, right? So people do use the word quick labor, right? Yes. I mean, what are some other terms? Clickbait. Yeah. Exactly. Quick, yeah. I mean, maybe there would be a way to name it that, I don't know how exploitative it is. Right, so somebody's working for IBM and they're bored, so they go over here and make a dollar. I mean, you know, is it terribly exploitative? I mean, it's far worse how Apple is polishing its cases and you know, China and toxic chemicals. So maybe there's a name for it that would maybe we would call it like distracted cognitive capital, <laughs> distracted <laughs> cognitive <laughs> capitalism. You know, or like that sounds um, wonderful. Like, you know, time you ripped off from your boss. You know, look like you were working, you know, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, maybe we, there'd be a way to ask. You know what Joseph Weizenbaum would say about yeah. this is what I think. You know, the, the idea that uh, framing uh, human activity in computational terms um, and putting uh, this type of um, essentially stuffing people into the automaton of the, of the mechanical Turk, right? That uh, that that's the, it's not so much that it, it's not the reference to Turkey. That's the problem there. It's it's actually uh, a deeper problem of how the how the project is formulated. That yeah. right now we're using people to do some tasks that happen to be hard for computers to do. As soon as we get that figured out, we won't have to deal with that. Right. Um, and so, I do want to point <laughs> out that the that the giant conversation could be. Yeah. What about the three day work week? Yeah. What about yeah. the what about the you know everybody gets yeah, the same bad. wage? Yeah. You know what I mean. There's so many conversations that we could be having in this universe instead of we're replacing all the truck drivers. Yeah. They're going to vote for Republicans. Right? I mean, we have such an impoverished imaginary around how to have this conversation. It's as though we, in our, I love the, the I'm coming back to Adam's metaphor again of the you know, culture as this deposit of memory. I mean, we've just forgotten the other part of the collective conversation, which is the social collective that tries to make things better for everybody in general, not for you know, a few people in particular. So I mean that's we've just kind of forgotten that whole conversation. Yeah. So well, uh, for well, me for example the uh, you know the ways in which like the uh, Amazon mechanical Turk and all this like uh, um, what I call just like this first factory. I yeah. mean in a way, you know, it's like I think Marx's wor worst dream because because it's a um, uh, hundred percent alienation. Because everybody is uh, uh, working in front of their computer screen, and the possibilities of uni unionization exist, but are not as easy as people interacting physically. Mm -hmm. And of course, social media plays uh, some role in it. But uh, I think uh, you know one of the aspects that uh, of this uh, topic that interests me is flows of social energies and how this changes with accelerations through circulation of content and memes and mm -hmm. everything else. Uh, uh, social media and, 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 and how much we still need the physical bodies and physical interactions between people. And of obviously questions about this, this new working class that is emerging in front of our eyes right now um, raises questions of what are we going to have a, 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 an equivalent of, of, the, of, a, in the, of a revolution of a, of a, against this and against the, the exploitations in this new emerging 
um, working class and, and whether you know the, the, the platforms such as social media will uh, allow for an accelerated process to, to, for people to, I don't know, unionize or do something else in order to make the world better, make this, make this working conditions better and, and equitable and so on. Or, uh, or not. Uh, and, and another point that I wanted to also answer to what um, uh, Kalan has been uh, saying about the, the questions of like how can we socially make things better, you know, uh, uh, through collective intelligence. The reason why I'm in my work employing this idea of uh, collective tamagotchi that I, that I was thinking a lot about um, um, is that, you know, I realized that, that there were about, I think, 76 millions of Tamagotchi, so, you know, just toys and egg-shaped uh, toys sold worldwide, 76, 76 million. Uh, but uh, what if actually one could imagine that all these people that bought these Tamagotchis would just take care of just one Tamagotchi? And we have this Tamagotchi, it's the planet Earth, basically, that is also an egg-shaped, uh, you know, that we can take care of. And obviously people are self-organizing uh, in various ways to take care of this collective Tamagotchi. And, uh, and this is a process of collective intelligence, self-organization. It's an emergent process. Not everything is just top-down, organized by politicians and governments, but there are things uh, and maybe to answer your earlier question about is there anything positive anyway, to kind of, you know, like as we're coming probably to like towards an end as well in this conversation, there maybe is something positive is this that so many people around the world are uh, involving and self organizing into this debate about climate change, and, uh, which I think is positive. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's obviously one of the many topics that Caroline mentioned that we have to discuss, as well as uh, things more directly rising from uh, the conversation we've had. So I think we should uh, move to informal conversation at this point. I think we should conclude. Thanks to those who Thank came, and thanks to uh, the panelists.